Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the fifth in this term's alumni lecture series. I'm so sorry that there's been a mix up about links and a delay to the start, but um, I'm very pleased to see you here. Uh, my name's Sophie Schermacher and I'm the Alumni Relations Officer at Green Templeton. Um, before we begin, I just have one or two bits of housekeeping to run through. Please note the session will be recorded and you'll have the opportunity to watch it again. You will all be muted during the event, and although we'll be holding a Q&A session at the end of Rasmus's talk, please bear in mind that we've had quite a high number of pre-submitted questions, but we will try and squeeze as many in as we can. Um, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Rasmus Kleist Nielsen. Rasmus is a Senior Research Fellow of Green Templeton College, Director of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism, and Professor of Political Communication at the University of Oxford. He was previously Director of Research at the Reuters Institute and Editor-in-Chief of the International Journal of Press Politics. Rasmus's lecture today will be on the topic, What is Happening to Our News? Over to you, Rasmus. Thank you very much, uh, Sophie, and thank you all of you for finding the time to uh, join this virtual event today. It's very good to see many dear friends from the college, uh, including uh, alumni uh, of the Institute Fellowship Program. I saw Edisola amongst others, very good to see your name there, as well as uh, I think both uh, Michael Dixon, our current principal, and Denise Leavesby, our former principal and a strong supporter of the Institute. So thanks everyone for joining uh, today. So I wanted to share a few observations uh, based on our research uh, at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism about what is happening to our news today and how research can shed light on some of the transformations that uh, many of us will see around us in glimpses as we rely in part on the news to navigate uh, the world around us and to understand the things that happen and that sometimes impact our lives quite directly. As sort of a framing device, uh, if you will, for um, this short presentation before we open up to a discussion uh, of you know, both where we are and, and, and the observations I will offer about where we might be heading. I wanted to offer us, if you will, a sort of a framing device, um, paraphrasing a quite a famous uh, formulation uh, from sociology, which is that I think we can say that we collectively make our news, but not under conditions of our own choosing. And in that sense, I wanna speak both about the choices that we make as members of the public uh, from the observation that news and journalism uh, is fundamentally based on its relationship with the audience that it serves um, and that it sustains itself from, but also about the structural or institutional changes in what we have to choose from uh, as citizens as we navigate uh, our media environment. Now, Green Templeton is a very diverse community today, as it's always been uh, for the alumni who are joining, uh, who may have left the college some time ago. And I want to stress here that while I'll talk about a few big structural trends that I think have global relevance, of course, you know, we should recognize up front that the journalism and news and media are not the same in every country around the world, even though we are seeing some very clear global trends, um, a increasingly sort of unfriendly, even hostile attitudes towards journalism and news media from many powerful people, including many governments, a, a move towards a more digital, mobile, and platform-dominated media environments in every country where people uh, can afford to embrace these media and where infrastructure allows them to access it and governments allow people to use them. Um, there are, of course, also really, really significant differences. Uh, differences between rich countries and poor countries, differences between uh, free countries and, and unfree countries, and differences even within countries between more privileged communities and less privileged communities of various sorts, whether on lines of uh, class or ethnicity uh, or other forms of structural inequality. But that, with that qualification, um, I wanted to offer, offer some observations about what is happening to our news, both at the level of the institutional changes and at the level of the changes that are driven by our choices as citizens and then a range of uh, possible scenarios for where we might be heading in the future. Um, and I do all this saying as a researcher that, you know, I'll leave for each of you to think about what you think news means in your life um, and whether you think of news as 
important, though admittedly imperfect, or whether you are more skeptical of the news and perhaps not convinced uh, that news and journalism as we know it is a net benefit for society. I will say that generally research suggests that at least in countries where it's done by professional journalists and by independent, genuinely free media, that news and journalism plays a really important role in our societies. It helps people be more informed about the world around them. Uh, it empowers people to take more active part in the political process. And it helps people connect with the communities uh, locally and, and nationally that they are part of or want to be part of in ways that may sound like a sort of an after dinner speech uh, given by a you know, misty eyed retired editor extolling the virtues uh, of his or her profession, um, but are uh, empirical observations based on hard science um, and, and things I think gives us reason to believe that it matters for all of us uh, what is happening to our news. Uh, and to journalism around the world. So with that said, I will jump in um, and I'll start with this uh, observation um, that I've used to capture some of the structural trends that I think we see, which is a quote, a famous quote from a, quite an old book almost a century ago uh, by Joseph Schumpeter, an Austrian political economist, uh, uh, who writes that the history of social change is a history of ongoing uh, uh, it, of ongoing evolution, but the history of economic change specifically is a history of revolutions, of an ongoing process of creative destruction that revolutionizes the economic structure from within, incessantly destroying the old one and incessantly creating a, a new one. And I offer this quote because I think one way of thinking about the developments that are underway um, in the news and media that we rely on as citizens is as a form of democratic curative destruction, if you will, where um, a, a range of dynamics that are to a large extent about the business uh, of news and the way in which it's changed because of technological developments and a new competitive situation have a set of ramifications um, for the opportunities that all of us have, the choices from which, uh, the options from which we are making the choices that we make as citizens uh, as we move forward. And that this creative destruction that is in large part economic in nature is often um, ahead, if you will, of the policy environment um, and, and even much of our way of thinking about the role of journalism and news in our societies, where we sometimes, I think, tend to rely still on inherited uh, conceptions of what journalism and news is uh, and what media organizations that enable it are like and how they operate. So, um, as promised, first some observations about the institutional changes that I think we can sort of capture as some of the defining features of this process of what I would put to you as a form of democratic creative destruction, at least in countries that are fortunate enough to have some form of democracy and in which journalism and news play such an important role. The first is the uh, long-term structural decline in print uh, as a medium. Um, I think everyone on a call like this will have heard much about the crisis of newspapers, but I think it's important to recognize that in sort of high income democracies with a long history of a mature press industry like the United States, for example, this is a very long term structural decline. And what I'm showing here um, on the slide is the change uh, since the Second World War in the uh, paid print circulation of daily newspapers relative to population in the United States as well as the share of overall advertising expenditure in the United States that went specifically to the newspaper industry. And as you can see immediately, this is a more than half a century of nonstop decline. Um, so in that sense, the uh, decline of the printed newspaper is nothing new. Um, it's been going on for a very long time. And now our important qualifications to this in terms of individual titles and in some countries like India, where um, print boomed much later than uh, in the United States or in the UK, of course, the story differs in important ways. But I think it's important here to recognize that much of the crisis of newspapers um, as a form of mass medium is nothing new. It's been with us for a very long time. Now, the reason to care about this um, is not sentimental, if you will, as, as sentimental as one might be about um, the pleasures that come with reading a printed newspaper, if that is one's preference and, and one's habit. Um, it is much more fundamental, which is that um, we, we should remember that even in a country like the UK that has a comparatively well-funded system of public service uh, media provision, as well as a, a, a large uh, and diverse commercial broadcasting sector and a growing number of digital only news publishers, 
print newspapers still account for a clear majority in the investment in original journalism. So the reason that we should care about their structural decline, both in terms of their reach, but also in terms of the revenues that the companies generate um, from uh, that business, from selling copies to audiences and in turn selling audiences attention to advertising, is that as that industry declines, so does newsroom employment, um, in particular at the local level, um, where uh, newspapers are often the only major outlet, uh, but also at the national level, where headcounts are declining as the industry revenues uh, decline. And now digital revenues, of course, have made up for a small subset of this loss in revenue, but so far, um, very far from what has been lost in terms of print. But as said, this is nothing new. The decline of print is a long-term structural development and has been with us for a long time, entirely foreseeable, and we have no reason to expect anything but that it will continue um, until print is entirely reduced to what it largely is already, which is a niche medium for serving a relatively privileged and older part of the public. Um, and no longer in any meaningful sense in the S medium, but it's still an important part of the business of news and thus underwrites much of the journalism that all of us rely on, including that which we consume online. Now, where is all this money going then, you might be asking? Well, um, the answer is relatively clear. As we all start to spend our time online instead, the advertisers that historically uh, bought our attention by paying newspapers good money uh, for running ads and now buy our attention from those who have it. And those who have it are, uh, broadly speaking, digital media and more than anything, a limited number of very large US-based for-profit platform companies, uh, Google and Facebook being the most prominent ones, that account for a very large share of our attention online uh, because they enable us to do many different things that we value. In the process, they collect detailed data about what we do and they use the reach that they have and the engagement, the share of the time that, that we spend with them to sell very cheap, uh, highly targeted, large-scale advertising to advertisers. Quite sensibly, advertisers are quite taken by this proposition. If it's cheaper, better targeted, and reaches lots of people, why not use it? Um, and again, uh, predictably, they have flocked uh, to the platforms at the expense uh, of incumbent industries who've been, as the term would have it, disrupted in the process. Now, this is very good for shareholders in Google and Facebook. Um, it also has some benefits for all of us who get to enjoy services that are free at the point of consumption because they are supported by advertising. The catch when it comes to news and journalism is that um, these uh, very commercially successful companies uh, are not primarily in the business of news. Um, and while they do have various partnerships with news publishers and they generate a lot of attention uh, to news uh, by referring people to things through search and social and the like, and also have various commercial relationships with news publishers. As a share of their overall uh, business, news is a very, very small part indeed, and they invest very limited resources, comparatively speaking, uh, to news compared to the decline in print. So money is moving and has been moving for a long time away from print, which invested a lot in news and journalism, towards digital media, where the largest companies, the ones that are succeeding most extravagantly commercially, are investing very little in news because news fundamentally is not very important to them. Um, and because the advertisers that are flocking to them are not very interested in news either. We need to remember, of course, that the only reason the advertisers spent money with news historically was not because of the journalism. It was because the news media controlled one of the few channels through which the advertisers could actually reach the audience. Now the advertisers have other cheaper, more targeted, at larger scale channels available to reach the audiences. They are quite rationally spending their money elsewhere uh, to great benefit for advertisers, arguably, certainly to great benefit for the shareholders um, and employees of the technology companies, but very disruptive for the business's news, uh, of news as we inherited from the 20th century. So this is the, if you will, the creative destruction, new institutions are being created, the platform companies, uh, we are in the process of trying to sort of socialize and regulate them as societies, and old ones like newspapers are being disrupted, some of them probably terminally so, um, others in the process of reinventing themselves, and I'm glad to say that some of those titles are doing very well indeed, and actually quite successful in adapting to a more digital environment. Now, um, what do these structural um, changes mean for the choices we can make and do make as individual uh, news consumers? Well, um, first of all, I think we need to recognize that we are really only in the beginning of um, an ongoing development in what is happening with our news um, because we are creatures of habit. And while the um, opportunities we have have been radically transformed by the emergence of digital media and the development of various platforms, 
uh, offerings, old habits die hard, and digital is often a supplement more than a substitute for older generations, even as younger generations come of age, who are largely native, if you will, to digital environment and regard print and increasingly broadcast television um, with the same sort of quaint uh, attitude that they might regard a telegraph um, or a steam engine with. Um, the numbers I'm showing you now, it's just a generational difference. It's a quite massive generational differences in um, the, the platforms or sources that different generations in our annual digital news report identify as their main source um, of news, where you can see very clearly uh, the sharp difference between an older generation, uh, sort of 55 and plus, um, where television is still clearly um, the most frequently named main source um, of news identified by a majority of 51% as their main source of news, even though many have embraced uh, online media and social media as their main source of news. Um, and then uh, very strikingly, uh, 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 if you will, symmetrical differences where you look at the young generation of the 18 to 24 year olds who respond to our survey where by now only 21% identify television as the defining mass medium of the second half of the 20th century. Um, as their main source of new and a massive 69% uh, identify uh, online. The reason these generational differences matter um, is not simply the sort of basic observation that young people and old people do things differently, that has always been the case, um, but just as a sort of a forceful reminder, if you will, um, that even if technological developments were to stop immediately and sort of completely cease tomorrow, we would still be living through the sort of the long rolling wave of generational replacement and business models and forms of journalism premised on the media habits of those who grew up in the 20th century and are still to some extent wedded to print or, or broadcast will gradually be replaced by the habits of those uh, who are coming of age now and who've grown up in an entirely digital mobile centered and platform dominated media environment and who may on occasion pick up the odd print publication or even watch something in broadcast television but are largely navigating the world through digital media, through mobile media, uh, and by relying on various forms of platforms. So the choices are there for all to make who have connectivity, at least in free societies, uh, the choices are meaningfully different by different generations. And we will expect to see these playing out uh, over um, the years to come. A second observation about the uh, changes underway in, in how we um, engage with news uh, as citizens and, uh, and how we use media in this changing environment is the changes in terms of um, how people discover news and navigate news in a very sort of practical sense, where I think a meaningful distinction can be made between what I would think of as sort of direct discovery um, and then what we would think of as sort of distributed discovery. Direct discovery is when I, as a user, go directly to a news provider, um, relying on a channel that this news provider sort of largely controls or exercise considerable influence over. So if I go to the shop and pick up a print newspaper, or if I turn on the telly and, and choose a channel, in both cases, this is a direct form of discovery. I've chosen a brand and I've sought out the way in which I can access the content that it provides. Um, in the online environment and digital environment, direct discovery is still important. There are people who have news apps on their phone. There are people who will type in the URL of a news provider, the BBC or a commercial competitor and go um, directly to the news provider. But when we ask people about the, all the different many ways in which they find and access news online, not just going direct, but also relying on social media, such as Facebook, search engines, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly the dominant one provided by Google, or various forms of aggregators and the like. By now, a very clear majority of news users say that they rely on various forms of distributed discovery, where the way in which we access the news is separate from the provider of the news and is controlled by a different entity with somewhat different interests and operations, if you will, from the news provider themselves. So if I go on Facebook and I see an article and then go to the news provider, this, this is a form of distributed discovery. I was using Facebook, but came across news. If I go directly to the website or app, um, it is a direct form of discovery. And this is a fundamental change in how news is used. Direct discovery was completely dominant in terms of how we navigate news uh, and media information for the longest time. Um, whereas in the online environment, increasingly uh, various forms of distributed discovery largely delivered by a few very large, even dominant technology companies um, are very, very central to how people access and find and use news. So 
um, if what I'm describing to you is true, that we see the disruption of an old industry print in particular, um, that was particularly important for the production and provision of news, the rise of new entrants, uh, relatively new by now, some of them are 20 years old or more, the platform companies that have grown so phenomenally successful by serving us in all sorts of different ways and making lots of money off of it, even as most of us also have some reservations about at least some of their practices around data collection and the like. Um, and we can see all of us making choices every day with our attention, voting with our eyeballs, so to speak, often in favor of digital, mobile, and platform media, and increasingly relying on their services, not just for navigating everyday life, but also for accessing and using and finding news. What might happen next uh, to the news and the media that we rely on as citizens? And what, if anything, can be done to influence uh, this development? Um, well, I'll offer a range of scenarios before um, we open uh, up for uh, some questions from the, those of you who found the time to join today or send in uh, questions uh, in advance. Um, the first scenario I would say is uh, what we might think of a sort of restoration where uh, we can imagine um, that the news media develop new business models um, that would sort of approximate um, the levels of funding, but also the share of attention uh, that news media accounted for in the late 20th, early 21st century. So a return to the future, if you will. Um, I think this is highly unlikely, uh, but it's not impossible. And there are clearly uh, voices in, in the industry who would seek, uh, seek this and who think of this as quite desirable, though I think it is worth remembering that I don't know of anyone under 40 who was, would prefer the media environment I grew up with uh, in the 90s to the one that we have today, at least amongst the audience, uh, even if many journalists and many in the industry may have many reasons to um, think fondly of the profit margins and the large um, and uncontested mass audiences of the not so distant past. The restoration, not impossible, but I would say unlikely given uh, the demonstrated preferences of all of us as citizens. We can think, um, I think also of an alternative scenario that I would think of as a sort of renewal, if you will, where the news industry and the news media um, uh, break with the uh, attempt to go back and think about what the roads ahead might be and whether um, given that we live in radically transformed societies and radically transformed media environments, whether instead of seeking to restore the old role there is a case to be made for thinking about a, a different set of roles that news media might seek, um, less solely uh, focused on um, essentially sort of the we publish and you read mindset of information provision and a bit more attuned to supplementing that with a sort of recognition of the fact that most people no longer have problems of information scarcity, but arguably pr problems of information abundance. Um, and that many of the informational problems that inflict our societies are not necessarily um, problems that can be solved solely through the provision of more information, but also require debunking uh, or pre-bunking even, as well as thinking about um, whether there are ways in which uh, news is produced and distributed that needs to be radically rethought to really reach the audiences that so demonstrably have turned their back on forms of news that they uh, often find uh, neither ref reflect, represent, or respect to them, their values or their ways of life, whether these groups are politically um, uh, marginalized or, uh, you know, minorities that have been ill-treated for many years by majoritarian uh, media uh, or simply people who are less privileged in many ways uh, along lines of uh, income and education life who also, I think, have many reasons to have grievances against the media as we knew them as well as how they operate today. So renewal, I think possible scenario, though it requires, um, I think, a a different disposition amongst journalists and news media uh, than what I would think of as sort of the main lines of much of the profession and the industry, though not all, some are reformists. Retreat is the third scenario um, that I would offer, which is, um, you know, one I think of as a real risk, though I, I don't think is the most uh, probable one. This is a scenario in which um, the news media um, look at the world in which we live um, recognize that um, we now have proof of concept of business models that serve the information needs of people like me. So people who are privileged, uh, affluent and well-educated, who are very interested in news, who are willing to pay for it, sometimes from several providers, um, 
and who have every reason to be quite sort of uh, content actually with the amazing abundance of high quality journalism that's available for them. Uh, some of it free, some of it for a reasonable price, all of it very easily accessible online and simply retreat to primarily serving this relatively small minority um, and through that retreat comes to sort of cease playing the kind of sort of popular enlightenment role that news uh, played in the 20th century through media like popular newspapers, but also through broadcast, most importantly public service, uh, and the widely read sort of metropolitan newspapers of the United States uh, in particular, and sort of retreat from that idea of a mass public and a popular enlightenment role for journalism, an inclusive form of journalism meant to be for everybody and settles for serving the few uh, who are demonstrably willing to engage and pay uh, from whom one can demonstrably play a build a sustainable business model, but which would in effect, I think, uh, involve the risk of reducing journalism to um, a stature in our society that comes closer to the fine arts, if you will, um, than that of a sort of truly democratic set of institutions for everybody. Uh, and I don't say that to condescend upon the fine arts. I think, you know, ballet and opera and the like are mighty fine things, but they are very different if you will, from the inclusive uh, popularity that characterized journalism and news media uh, in many countries in much of the 20th century. Finally, um, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize a fourth R in my alliteration and also just recognize that there is also a, um, a very real scenario in which the future of the news is one in which a relatively brief period of relative autonomy driven in, in part by political support for the importance of independent journalism and free media, but also uh, importantly through the commercial success of for-profit news publishing, uh, fades away and we see a return to what is arguably the most common outcome, both historically, but also across much of the globe today, where um, news media cease to be relatively independent of the most important political and commercial uh, holders of power and become instruments, if you will, that are co-opted or even captured and relegated to serving various political and commercial ends that have little if nothing to do with independent news provision and become instruments and organs of influence um, that are run not to inform the public or hold power to account, but as one of the many different instruments uh, that powerful interests use uh, as they struggle for money and influence uh, in society. Now, um, some of these choices uh, or these outcomes will depend on our choices individually um, as uh, media users and as citizens. As I said, you know, we, you know, the news that we get uh, depend in large part on the news that we make, if you will, the choices we make. We make our own news media, but also I want us to recognize that not under conditions of our own choosing, of course, in part, in, in large part in authoritarian, totalitarian societies or poor societies, but also in a country like the UK, which is very privileged in a global perspective. But there are also collective choices to make here that are not simply about the aggregate of our individual choices. There are policy choices. Um, and in that sense, the future of news and media depend on journalists and they're willing to change and media organizations, their willingness to change as well as our choices uh, as members of the public, but also on policy. Um, there are meaningful options that are available to policymakers if they were genuinely interested in creating a more enabling environment for independent news media and for professional journalism. And I would simply end uh, with this observation that given that the options are available, we know that they exist. We see a few countries that in fact practice them, um, whether through independent public service media or various forms of direct and indirect subsidies for professional news production offered to private commercial providers. Um, I think it is quite noticeable um, that these are almost never pursued. Um, this is what uh, policy scholars would call sort of deliberate non-intervention or negative policy where options are available, they could be pursued, but they are not a priority. Uh, and in this sense, I think there are individual choices we make as uh, citizens and consumers, um, but also collective choices we make as societies about whether we make collectively binding decisions uh, through our elected officials and through various forms of policy and regulation to actually support journalism and news that is clearly imperfect in many, many important ways, but also I would say as a citizen, but also more important in this context as a researcher, we have many reasons to believe with these imperfections play a really important role in our society, have done so in the past, and I hope we do so in the future too, though we need to recognize that this risk, this role is under tremendous pressure because of the development that I have outlined here today. With that, um, thank you very much, and I look forward to the questions.
You're muted, Sophie. Sorry, sorry, I didn't realise I was muted, but it's thrown by the delay. Um, we do have plenty of pre-submitted questions. Um, and the first one I'll start with was, is what could happen to democracy if our newsrooms go broke? Well, um, we would see even higher levels of information inequality between those uh, citizens who are most active and engaged and seek out most different sources of information. Um, and then the larger majority of people who are interested in public affairs and politics, but less so than in other things in life that may be more compelling and attractive, uh, like private affairs and uh, community affairs um, and, and the like. So greater information inequality. Um, we have uh, a fair amount of research um, from the United States, but I think this is broadly applicable in other contexts too, suggesting that the, even the presence of, of independent news media, even in contexts where not everybody actually makes use of them as citizens have a uh, salutary effect uh, on many parts of public life, including increasing the likelihood that elected representatives vote in line with their constituents' policy preferences, perhaps, uh, usefully disciplined by the consciousness that someone is keeping an eye on them. And also that uh, independent news media um, uh, are associated with lower levels of corruption, both in the private sector and the public sector, as well as greater efficiency in the public sector. So I think we have much to lose um, uh, from um, uh, the risks and the, from the sort of the threats to, to journalism and news media as we knew them, even though they weren't perfect. Um, and most fundamentally, perhaps the sort of the creeping sense that we don't know what we don't know. Um, and that if we think of all the different things that journalists, when they've had the chance, have uh, revealed to us and exposed in terms of the incompetence uh, or even maliciousness of, uh, of private or public figures, um, that we will fundamentally never know what we are not told uh, if we have to live in a world without independent news and media and professional journalists. And of course, we need to recognize that much of the world already live in that context. And we can see that cost very, very clearly day to day in terms of the rampant abuse and self-enrichment that characterize so much as sort of private life and, and public life in, in many parts of the world that don't have the relative privilege of having uh, strong news media and professional journalists. Um, the next question we've had is, how do you think the COVID-19 crisis may impact on newsrooms, or I suppose is impacting on newsrooms? Uh, it's been really tough. Um, you know, I think there was sort of a first uh, encouraging sort of wave of interest and a surge in news use as the pandemic hit different countries and citizens quite understandably recently turned to news providers in part for information about what to make of this new and, and challenging situation. Um, but this surge has sort of started to fade uh, over time as the pandemic becomes sort of a form of new normal, um, even as the challenges remain for newsrooms across the world. How do you cover the news when you are severely constrained by various lockdown measures? Uh, how do you cover a very complex and challenging and fundamentally poorly understood phenomena like the coronavirus um, uh, when often in, in most newsrooms you don't have the privilege of having a specialized science correspondent who is well equipped to really engage with say medical professionals or medical researchers and really understand the science behind the disease as well as responses to it. How do you cover that? How do you cover that while working remotely? And of course, fundamentally again, uh, because most independent professional journalism is fundamentally funded by for-profit companies, the economic consequences of the lockdown and the crisis are very severe. And we've seen a spate of layoffs at news media across the world in response to declining advertising revenues uh, driven in large part by the crisis. So I think the crisis has illustrated the importance of journalism at its best, though, of course, also its various other variations. Um, uh, and I've been, you know, very impressed with the best journalism we've seen. I think we owe a tremendous uh, debt of gratitude in a way as, uh, as citizens to some of these investigations we've seen into government uh, and others and, and just the sort of way in which journalists have helped make really complicated and difficult information from medical scientists and experts available to us as citizens of labor people. But it's also clear that the crisis is a tremendous challenge uh, for an already challenged profession and industry. Thank you. Um, the next question is, the discussions about public funding for journalism have been increasing. Do you believe that it is a non-returning route?
think that's where it comes. One is that uh, as a researcher, I can say, as I've tried to suggest in the brief presentation I opened with, that um, there is a very real risk for what economists would call market failure uh, in terms of the provision of public interest uh, journalism. Um, if there is market failure, um, then there is a case for a policy intervention. Um, and we know for a fact that there are forms of policy that are available that would make a meaningful difference. Um, as a citizen, I suppose that I, I am personally convinced that in countries where we can be confident that such forms of support um, will not be abused by politicians to try to capture and uh, bring to heel independent news media and journalists the way they clearly will be in, in some other countries, uh, then I think on balance that these policies make a lot of sense. Um, and as a and as a sort of citizen, um, you know, I I, I um, regard calmly the prospect of my tax money being spent amongst other things on supporting uh, professional journalism and news media. But I would say on that, I think we need to be realistic and and see that it is probably a minority of uh, members of the public and certainly a minority of politicians. Um, who regard that prospect quite as calmly as I do. Um, and anyone who thinks differently, however fond they might be of journalism and news media, I would invite them to go door to door um, and knock on doors and ask people uh, or sort of campaign on the slogan of, you know, higher taxes and more journalists um, or, you know, fewer nurses and more journalists and just sort of think about what kind of response a politician could reasonably expect if they were to make that pitch uh, to the public in a context where in a country like the UK, it's only a relatively small minority of the public who say they trust most news most of the time. And, and I think would probably take some convincing before they thought it was reasonable uh, to spend their hard earned money uh, on propping up an institution in the profession that I think has a lot going for it, that, but that much of the public regards uh, with somewhere in between indifference and contempt. Thank you. Um, we have another question here, which I've had to shorten. It's quite a long question, but a recent working paper from Jochai Bentler et al. says President Donald Trump is exploiting core standard practices of professional journalism to disseminate disinformation about the upcoming election. This was obviously before. <laughs> what is your understanding of the vulnerabilities in cur current journalism practices Bentler is pointing out? Are the traditional newsroom practices that have become dysfunctional in a changed political landscape and ecosystem? And are there any suggestions on what to do, including the more normative? I mean, first of all, I want to recognize that this is a hard nut to crack for journalists and editors. And, and I try to make it a rule of not telling people how to do their jobs. Um, but I, I will say, I think the study by Yoffa and his uh, colleagues, I think powerfully illustrates the limitations of um, a professional approach to impartiality that 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 risks um, amounting to sort of a he said she said form of false balance, where you know one source says the earth is round, another says the earth is flat, and then the headline is views and shape of the earth differ, uh, which is a form of impartiality, but is poorly aligned with the fundamental commitment of journalists to seek truth and report it, because sometimes the truth is the earth is round, no matter how many people insist otherwise. Um, we've seen this in climate change for a long time, uh, where, um, you know, an, an understandable, but I think fundamentally quite um, destructive commitment to uh, impartiality led to really quite skewed coverage uh, from the point of view of scientific consensus. And what Joffa and his colleagues have shown is that um, in the case of the uh, now, um, at some point, probably leaving um, President of the United States, um, there was a ruthless willingness to abuse this commitment um, through by trying to leverage journalism to um, to spread demonstrably false allegations about the uh, supposed fraud with mail-in ballots in the United States in a way that has demonstrably spread this message far wider than the president would ever be able to do on his own, even with social media, and have effectively reduced a lot of news media to being unwitting accomplices with an organized disinformation campaign driven from the White House itself that propagates demonstrable falsehoods and lies about American elections um, and, and have left us with quite a messy situation uh, after he lost uh, the, the election. So I am glad to see that the many journalists and editors are now questioning this form of impartiality, even though they often remain vetted to impartiality more broadly. But that said, I have to say, it's not an easy call 
to um, for a journalist uh, to point out that someone might be lying. Uh, in particular, this is someone that we consider to be sort of a legitimate participant in the public debate. Um, and of course, in, if one does so, in particular with politicians, to the supporters of that politician, any kind of progressive challenging or 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 um, or, or or limitation of uh, willingness to spread their views will come across as censorship and partisanship and bias, really. And of course, this is exactly what we see in the United States. So I'm glad we're seeing a rethinking around this, but I also want to recognize it's not easy. And I understand the choices made by many editors and journalists in this difficult terrain. Thank you. Um, I'd, quite, I'd like to squeeze in two more questions if you're happy with that. Um, are newspapers worth saving as commercial enterprises? Um, I mean, some newspapers and, and which ones, it depends on, is in the eye of the beholder. Um, I mean, I think more fundamentally, um, what I believe very fervently that we have good reasons to, to, to say is that um, for all its demonstrable shortcomings and imperfections, for-profit news provision has been an absolutely central and integral part of our democracies. And in many countries around the world, um, uh, again, imperfect as it is, is far better than anything that has anything to do with the state, because the state won't show the kind of restraint that we can hope for, at least in some countries around the world. Um, and in that sense, I believe very strongly that we should all as citizens believe that commercial news provision is worth saving. Whether that's based on print or not, I think is entirely uh, immaterial. Uh, but for-profit news publishing, I would very much hope remains a central part of our media environments for a long time to come. Thank you. So uh, we come to the last question now, which uh, is hopefully we'll end on a, on a positive note. <laughs> um, of all the talk of readers doom scrolling news during COVID-19 lockdowns, as well as fears of news manipulation and fake news coming from Russia and China, is there any hopeful trend in the future of news? I mean, fundamentally, I'm a cautious optimist um, in the sense that I would say that uh, our own evidence-based research gives us reason to believe that many people find news important and valuable. Some are worth paying, uh, some find it worth paying for, um, and that people are sort of seeking out providers that I think they have good reason uh, to, to trust, and in fact, often trusting those providers. So. I think there are some reasons for optimism, both about the importance of journalism, its value and its public recognition of that value, even though this is, uh, these are choppy waters and there are real challenges. And I would also say that while it is clear that there is a lot of, frankly, to use a scientific term, crap journalism out there uh, without judging um, the people involved in producing it because they rarely choose to do it. It's uh, the best that they can do given the situation that they're in. I would also offer to you that my personal uh, assessment is that we live in a golden age of journalism in the specific sense that the best journalism today, I think, is better than it's ever been. Um, and incredibly important in terms of uh, both helping us as citizens navigate the world and understand the world, but also in terms of exposing what powerful uh, politicians or powerful companies are doing and doing to us um, and, and giving us access to information so that we independently can make up our own minds about what they are doing and doing to us. Um, and, and for people who would question that, and I think there are many reasons to question that in part because we often have very high expectations of journalism in that sense are, are perhaps a bit disappointed by its uh, actuality, if you will, uh, as in many things in life, it may short, fall short of our um, ambitions on other people's behalf. Um, I would just invite them to consider, you know, how those of us who live in the UK or those of us who may live in the US you know, what would we know about the state of the coronavirus crisis in our respective countries if we had only had access to the information that the government sees fit to share with us? That for me would be a nightmare scenario and even in democracies and that's leaving aside entirely the very real risk and costs that are, are borne by citizens in countries who don't have access to such journalism like my uh, in-laws in Nicaragua um, or, or many other citizens across the world. So in that sense, I think we see incredible power and value of journalism every day, even if we don't always recognize it, and even if it often falls short of what we would hope for. Um, and I recognize that much of it is um, limited uh, and um, ephemeral, if you will, but I would also say that some of it is outstanding and incredibly valuable. Um, and I don't think it's sort of succumbing to um, 
and Glossian optimism uh, or, or cheerleading to say that, um, that some of it is a real public value and benefits all of us as citizens as well as our societies as a whole. Um, and in, this, in a sense, in that sense, uh, you know, uh, we have something to be um, to appreciate about it and perhaps motivations for thinking about the choices we make and whether we feel that it's worth in fact supporting it uh, if we recognize that value and want it to exist in the future as well. Thanks so much Rasmus, some, some real food for thought there actually. So thank you so much, really appreciate you um, giving such a, a wonderful talk and I hope everyone enjoyed it. Um, I'm so sorry again about the delay with the start. However, the, so the session is being recorded and you'll all be sent a link so everyone will be able to access it and watch again at your leisure and watch the full version <laughs> this time. Um, we have one more lecture left in our series. Um, in two weeks time, we have Professor Gr Trish Greenhalgh talking. So um, please do look out for invitations in your inbox and links that will work this time, I promise. <laughs> um, and in the meantime, thank you so much for joining us and thank you, Rasmus. Thanks for having me.